Coming to you from Lagos, Nigeria, it's Moments. Tonight, we focus on initiatives or help that is available for women who have been through rape. Our guests on the show today are Uruwa Shion Ayodeji Oshowobi, founder of Stand to End Rape Initiative. One of the most um, touching story for me is um, a four-year-old girl who was raped by the school bus driver. And Kemi Da Silva, founder of Women at Risk International Foundation. Rape is more than just a physical act. It's, it's a rape of one's spirit. It's a rape of one's mind. It's moments, and it all begins now. You're watching Moments Nigeria. Our first guest is a very, very brave young lady. Oluwa Shewun Ayodeji Oshowabe is the founder of the Stand to End Rape Initiative. Um, she is a rape survivor and um, she founded the NGO in order to help others dealing with the aftermath of rape. Oluwa Shewun, it's so nice to have you on our welcome, show. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for having me. Thanks How for coming feeling? back. Very well. You know, a while ago you were on yeah. the show and yes. you shared your story with us, but life has continued for you and you yeah. started the Stand to End Rape Initiative, which you had then. Yes. So today on the show, we're talking about dealing with rape. Mm -hmm. And between now and then, we want to find out what has changed. What has changed about the narrative of rape in our community and in our society? Has anything even changed? I think a lot has changed. At the time I was on the show, um, rape was not something people were talking about at the time. But lately on social media, offline, you see people coming forward to say, you know what, I think this what happened to me could have been rape. Mm -hmm. I think I've been raped, can I get support? So I think um, our community perception has changed a lot on how parents even view rape. Mm -hmm. Back then, um, parents would tell you, don't talk about it, don't bring shame to the family. Mm -hmm. But you see more parents actually making a phone call to the NGO to say, you know what, my daughter or my son has been raped, mm -hmm. can you help us? Mm -hmm. So I think a lot has really changed. I'm really excited that, you know, um, I put a foot forward and so many people have followed afterwards. I'm mm -hmm. really happy Very about that. Very brave of you, I must Thank commend. you. Uh, uh, you know, of course, a lot of people are watching right now. For some, this may be their first time of, you know, watching you on, on, on the show. So when did you decide that I'm going to speak out about this that happened to me? And do you, did you think that it sort of brought some sort of healing as well for you? Um, I made up my mind to come forward in 2012, 2013 rather, and it was a bit difficult for me uh, because I just started stand to end rape then as an online initiative so i would um, ask people to come forward to share their stories i would counsel them via dm and call them or, or do an email just something i could do to help but some people were not open towards me because they felt oh she can't understand where i'm coming from or she doesn't even know my struggle um so i made up my mind you know what let me put that foot out there and you know what let people know that i'm there with them i understand um what they are going through so yeah i, I did come forward in 2014 and um, it was a bit um, interesting. Did you tell your friends, family? Anyone you did? When it happened, I told my parents first um, mm. because, um, you know, rape is a big issue and you can't keep it to yourself. So I felt like I'd let my family members down and I was a disgrace to my family. So I was a bit scared or skeptical to tell them. But because I have a very close relationship with my mom and so I could tell her anything. And so I put a call through to my family and I was really shocked. They were very supportive. At uh, the point, I think I was suicidal because I couldn't take the mm. blame and the shame anymore. But because my parents were really open to me, you know, it gave me um, a notch that, you know, I could get through this. So, yeah, I spoke to my parents and um, I got healing by speaking up because helping other people was my own way of healing as well. You know, mm. when I want to break down, or I want to cry. I just want to give up. I remember that someone out there is relenting on me and I need to put myself together and get strength for them. So yeah. Wow. Now I want to talk about, you know, the initiative and the work you've done since you started. Um, tell us a little bit about some of the stories that you've come across and also have you been able to impact people's lives and help them with, you know, dealing with life after rape? Um, we've worked with a lot of people, maybe not a lot, but so many people and um, I've had stories that have broken my heart. I've had stories that I couldn't sleep at night. I would cry and like, oh, God, why is this happening? Um, I think one of the most um, touching story for me is um, a four-year-old girl who was raped by the school bus driver. And this, the perpetrator was arrested, but unfortunately, by law, rape is bailable. And so the school that ought to protect the girl actually paid the bail for um, the perpetrator. Okay. 
And so, because we don't have a social security system right. in Nigeria, he was able to run away. But what were the grounds they gave for bailing out the bus driver? That's what I want to understand. Why I mean, they, they were in denial. Um, mm. Even with evidence that, okay, um, a four-year-old girl doesn't understand what sex is. She doesn't have anything to gain by engaging in sex. So definitely, mm. she cannot lie about it. Yes. And then we asked her like twice, you know, with her, with her grandmother and separately. And nothing about her work changed from the part where he asked her to come into the classroom, he undressed her and put his penis into her vagina. Nothing about that chain. And someone who is four years old could remember mm. every detail of but, the experience. You know, this is my question. I, I, I admire the work you're doing. Well done for Thank you. speaking up. But I, I refuse to believe that you've been doing this all by yourself. Are there no NGOs? Or are there no... The I mean, have you reached the government, mm. for instance? That's a four, that, guy, that child's future has been haunted you know yeah. this is something that would live with her for the rest of her life Definitely. you know so when you speak out and tweet and put these things out there do you even get support from the government <sighs> government support um it's it's very dicey i would say yes and i'll say no um i'll say yes in respect to sometimes having to call the domestic and sexual violence response team you know um, we need someone in this area to support or we need to contact this um, police person they are very helpful with that. Um, but when it comes to justice itself, because mm -hmm. the legal part of justice is also part of the government, mm -hmm. that is very ridiculous. So do you, you think have legislation actually needs to be implemented or changed to ensure that more rape survivors get actually. justice? Mm -hmm. Changed, we have laws, they're not being enforced. Mm -hmm. But that's not the problem. The problem is the judicial system is too long. So we can be on a case for three, four years, that's sometimes 10 years, yeah. that's and you expect the survivor to come to court to give account of what has happened. Mm -hmm. That alone is very traumatizing. So it's, it's, I would say the government has really done well. Lagos, for example, has put in very amazing laws and bodies to support, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. Wow, we don't mean to stop you right there. This has been very informative. When we come back, our second guest joins us. Welcome back to Moments Nigeria. Today's topic is dealing with rape and our next guest is Jola Ayeye and she is the head of programs at the Stand to End Rape Initiative. Welcome to the show, Jola. Thank you. Looking very pretty. Coming. Thank you. Very pretty. How are you? Thank you. So I'm you fine, thank you. What you do at this initiative and what the head of programs, what does it mean? Okay, um, I joined Stand to End Rape in 2014. I think it was and I'd seen them on social media a lot and so I just sent a DM, do you need any help with speaking on rape or social media because I wasn't in the country at the time. So she was like, sure. And she would send me things and say, oh, could you make a thread on this? Or could you talk about this? Could you read up on this? And then eventually she just said, oh, by the way, you know, this is a communications job. So you're basically our communications manager. Is that okay with you? And I said, yes. And recently we've planned a couple of events. Some of them have fallen through and some of them have been successful. But recently we've been planning and trying to come up with an idea on how to get women who are living in close contact with their abuser. So this could be domestic violence mm. or sexual violence. You need to move them out of that space. We don't have the structures or we don't have the ease of movement as other countries do. And there's a death of that in Nigeria. So you can imagine a toddler or a teenager or even a housewife or someone who's, who's reliant on their rapist or their domestic abuser. They want to go to trial, they want to just get out. They may not even want to take the person to court, they just want mm -hmm. to get out of that space. Mm -hmm. Where are you going to? Yeah. So the program that I am in charge of at the moment is called the Safe Space Program. And so we're applying for grants and loans and speaking to other NGOs that have similar sorts of programs that are in-house programs to mm -hmm. get people out of the immediate dangerous environment. And what's the response? Like, have you guys been able to raise funds for it? No, not yet. But we're working really hard on it. The thing is, it was a very idealistic idea. We're also excited as you are when you start a new project. But then there's security issues. Yeah. If you tell me to open up my home to somebody, how do I know who they are? How do I know the attacker isn't going to come after me? How yes. am I sure that I can fend for them? Because I may be a generous spirit, but I have a budget. I'm living on a budget. Is there a way you can help me out with subsistence? So I'm feeding them, and I'm sure that at least they're eating. They have a space to sleep. You know, we have a thing called... it's. This exuberance, but if you're keeping someone in your home, you have to know that you can't go around telling people that, ah, I'm helping somebody because yes, they might yes. get back to their abuser. So there are lots of logistics that we're working through very, very seriously. It's not just an idealistic idea. Mm. We have to make sure people are safe. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. And in terms of the victims, you know, you're talking about getting them um, a safe space yes. and a safe shelter away from their attackers. Yes. But in terms of the, you know, psychological impact the rape has had on them, do you also offer other services in terms of maybe uh, counselling or even helping them get back on their feet? Because with a lot of women, you know, if they're being raped, you mentioned housewives and husbands, yes. they may not have the financial capability to stand on their own. Mm -hmm. So is there any way you can kind of, you help them get back into the job market or anything like that? The interesting thing is we had a meeting about this a couple of days ago and um, one of our colleagues has come up with an idea called the Livelihood Programme and she's in charge of that. But what the Livelihood Programme is about is economic empowerment, especially for people who have found themselves as, we don't really like calling people victims, we like calling them survivors. Mm -hmm. And so we found that lots of survivors one of their biggest issues is economic freedom. Mm. Because even as horrific as sustained abuses, you'll be surprised what the human instinct for survival will put up with. Mm. So if your idea is that I need to survive, you're almost able to have like cognitive dissonance. I'll separate myself from what's happening to me because this is helping me survive. And so it's very important to us to find ways of redefining charity and that's very important to us you have to redefine what charity is it's not just giving money so for us it's helping them find skills it's helping them find new jobs it's helping them find ways to sort of like repackage themselves into yes. someone who can stand on their own yeah. and because we don't want to be a crutch we want to make it holistic enough that you come and we help you with skills acquisition or skills updates or, or providing you with a network of people who can help you. So you can go on to help other people by yourself. Sure. You're not constantly coming I'm back. I've got to ask you this because th there's an issue of, I mean, the safe space thing is what I'm thinking in my head. There's an issue of, you know, someone is constantly being abused and they open up to you. But then when you even want to help them, there's almost like, they've gotten to a point where, you know, as the abuser also becomes their... Stockholm Syndrome. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. How do you handle situations like that? You know, if people give you a tip off, for instance, that on this street there's father raping his daughter, and you show up there, and mm -hmm. even in the beginning she opens up to you, but you come the next day, and it's almost it's like... It's complex. From it's so complex, because you have to remember it's not about you, it's about the person. And so a, a survivor might not respond in the way you hope they would. So you might go there with good intentions and you're going to get out of the house and she's going to leave him today. And she, the first thing she says is, what's your business? Mm -hmm. Is it you that they are beating? Or you have might you not. Like that? Well, I, I don't deal directly with. Have you um, had? We had a case, it's not, it's not domestic violence, the ca case of rape. And it was two cousins um, being raped by their neighbor who is a guy. And so we're having a walk on the street in 2014 and someone tipped us. And we went to the house, we met with the parents and they were first in denial, like don't bring shame to our family and things like that. But we're able to talk them to understand that, you know what, have you taken this boy to a hospital? They said no. So yes, it's very susceptible to getting HIV infection or any STI so at all. Boy that was being yes, by another boy. By another boy. So we, we, we got to talk to them and, and they came around. Thank you very much, Shella. We're going to continue this conversation and that continues shortly. can actually use an instrument to rape a person as long as something external enters into their private parts. Rape is more than just a physical act. It's, it's a rape of one's spirit. It's a rape of one's mind. And so your role is the role of any caregiver. And this is why we're here. It's a walk-in clinic. It's at no cost to anyone. There is no criteria except that you, know, you need the care, you find where we are and you come. We're also going to offer a 24-hour crisis helpline for women that are too embarrassed or perhaps live too far to reach us, then at least they can ring and we can hopefully administer some sort of care even you know, through the phone line. Welcome back to Moments Nigeria. We're still on the topic of dealing with rape and we're still with our guests. Jola and Ayodeji. So, you know, before the break, we were talking about the fact that, you know, financial empowerment is one of the kind of big problems mm -hmm. and empowering victims by helping them get jobs is kind of, you know, one of the ways to help them move forward. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of just getting them back on their feet, what other help do you think that, you know, victims need in order to just go back to living their regular lives and moving away from, you know, from the ordeal? I think it's just a very holistic approach. So they need the medical aspect of it, they need the psychosocial aspect of it, and that's where the economic comes in as, as well. Um, but most importantly for me, aside uh, the psychological help that they need, is actually getting back on their feet. Um, like she said, for those who are dependent on the abuser, 
they need something. So if I'm asking you to leave where you are at the moment, what am I going to? What's the alternative for me? Um, so we are working on this project to ensure that, you know, if it's someone who has been out of a job, perhaps a housewife, for like two years and she's not used to the market anymore. So we get someone who's going to mentor her and help her get back to, um, to yeah. If it's someone who has talent for business, and doesn't have the funds. So we will provide the funds and have people train um, the, the client on what she wants to do or what he wants to do. And then we'll monitor their progress over time. Then they can stand on, on their own. Very quickly, let's just talk about data coalition in terms of numbers and mm -hmm. how it's been over the years. Because we do have structures and firms and NGOs and you know, initiatives like this come. I'm sure even before you started yours, you'd probably heard about yeah. so many others. Like in the last five, 10 years, would you say that rape cases, would you say there's been an increase? Do you know an exact figure of, you know, yearly, how many people are raped, for instance, female, male? Like, we just want to get a picture of, you know, the data coalition. As regards data, I think from our own work, because we don't have a general data in Nigeria, which we're working on um, to get for this year, but sometime in 2015, we had about 697 cases in Lagos State. Um, in our own NGO, I think we've, we've experienced more cases being reported. And I think it's even more cases of domestic abuse than even sexual violence. I would say maybe by 5% or 7% thereabout, uh, because we are not the only NGOs working in Nigeria. So we work in Lagos, uh, Oshu, and Dabuja. So based on the cases we have received, I think it's increased a bit, and more on children um, when it comes to rape. Very sad. I have a question for you. I've always wondered, you know, um, as a victim, do you believe in chemical castration? Do you think that rapists, no, because in some countries, especially, you know, in the Far East, they do yeah. have chemical castration. So if you're a rapist, sorry, you are going to get your member and yeah. that will be it. There's, even if you have the urges or the thoughts, there will be no way you can carry out carry out the act again yeah. so I've always wanted you know just just to hear um, your opinion I mean I don't believe in that because rape has expanded now it's not only using your body parts you can use an mm -hmm. object yeah. by the law by the Va violence against persons permission act you can actually use an instrument to rape a person as long as something external enters into their private parts is rape mm -hmm. so if you castrate a man or you use chemical um, whatever it is it can seize an, an object to rape someone. So it doesn't change that. It's actually changing per the perspective and mentality of mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. and actually building positive masculinity in boys. Because mm -hmm. you tell boys, you know what, um, you're, you're allowed to be angry. Mm -hmm. You tell a boy, don't cry. Boys don't cry. Why are you crying like a girl? You know, you mm -hmm. tell them these are forms of weakness, you know, and the only way they can show that is through anger. When yeah. you put so much thing inside, how do you express it? anger and bitterness and things like that so if we can change that mindset i think a lot will change yeah. not just the castration thank you so much ladies for coming on the show and before we let you go how can people reach you if they need to contact you we can be reached on social media at stand to end rape we can be reached via email contact us at stand to end rape org or stand to end rape at gmail.com we can be reached on phone as well zero eight zero nine five nine six seven thousand you can okay. take that again Zero eight zero nine five nine six seven thousand. All right. Thank you very much, Ayan. Thank you, Thank you Jala, for coming. Thank you. Coming up shortly, it's going to be time for In a Nutshell. In a Nutshell, Toke and Bolanle. This, I was almost crying actually, mm. you know, in some parts because I feel like, you know, when a woman goes through such a hiring ordeal, the blame is on her. Yeah. And it's like it shouldn't be. She is the victim in the situation. And I feel more needs to be done to make sure women do get their day in court and you know beyond that do get justice their perpetrators should have to go to jail mm -hmm. or pay a fine or or something something should come out of it to you know just to justify what they've been through and to atone for it yeah i completely agree with you i think for me i was disheartened because i didn't hear enough you know, conversation about how the police and the government is doing enough to make sure that mm. rape victims feel encouraged to mm. take their you know rapists to court and like she said the legal, the period for justice is too yes. long. Yeah. Nobody wants yeah. to be talking about the same thing for four or five years. Yeah. So I would like to see that changed. Well, you Definitely. guys have actually said it all. And I think mm. that that's the reason why we keep hearing that it's on the rise because the legal system hasn't done enough. Mm. If people knew that there was, Repercussion. if you rape, mm. you yeah. die. Mm -hmm. There's no rape, deterrence. You would be sent, sent to death by hanging yeah. because mm. you're killing someone for you doing are. that. Mm. If they realize that that was the case, 
then a lot more people will begin to have the fear of the law. Yeah. And that's in every area, just not only in this case as well. Mm. But I mean, I like the fact that we had a brilliant young girl who mm -hmm. stepped out of her own feelings mm. and decided to do something about it, mm. which I hope you've learned something from. Mm.